Welcome to the Dawnbreaker Saga. This is the story so far. Since we've come to the end of several major quest lines, including the main quest, and I'll be moving on to a new phase in September, I wanted to do an overview of the series and its characters. We're three years and over 300 episodes into the story, and I need to start making a new playlist before I hit YouTube's limit. I intend for this to be the first video in that playlist. The Dawnbreaker Saga is a Skyrim epicosity project, which is a term coined by Couch Warrior in episode 4 of the Character Crusade podcast, and is used to describe a story, as opposed to a let's play or walkthrough, that is character-driven and involves many characters doing the various Skyrim questlines, rather than one all-powerful dragonborn doing everything. His Lorcon Saga and 57 Strudels Walking from the Light are the only other full epicosity projects that I'm aware of, with the massive Fellowship-style cast and character-driven story. The first ever trailer for the Dawnbreaker Saga went up on August 24th, 2017, which will be three years ago today as of publishing this video. Besides the Dawnbreaker's videos, the saga also encompasses the Honorless, Intonation, Vagrant, Unblooded, Executioner, and Book of Shadows playlists. The complete saga includes all of these videos in roughly in-world chronological order. In this video, I'll be going over the important characters in the order they were originally published, and then touch on what might be coming next for the Dawnbreakers. Spoiler warning! This will obviously contain spoilers for the story, including potentially the biggest plot twists in the series. Look away now if you want to experience the story without them. If you are going to go back through from the beginning, I commend you on your bravery. If you're looking for a less spoilery overview, I'll have a Thalmor report coming out in a few days that I'll link to in the info card. If you're here looking for background on specific characters, I've included the time-stamped chapters in the description. Let's get into it. Wait, oh. Yep, that's Wolfgar. Good morning. Kinoa Almerzine was the first character I ever created for the Dawnbreakers saga. Her first appearance was actually back in February of 2017, but I had no story attached to her. I consider those first few episodes a build test for her, but she didn't actually appear in the story until April 2018, more than a year later. Her introduction story is honorless, and was actually the last of the main four to be introduced. So who is she? Kinoa is a shy, polite, soft-spoken redguard who also happens to be our team's dragonborn. She's a sword and board, heavy-armored fighter who was begrudgingly trained by her father, an arrogant and belligerent Alakir warrior, but she has a more mystical side as well. Kinoa is also a healer, and a devotee of the Divine of Winds and Rain, variously known as Tava, Kinarthi, Kinareth, and Kain. Her connection to Kain manifests in various ways throughout the series. She is able to call a spectral bow specifically for hunting dragons, and she often interprets animal omens and makes sacrifices to Kain. And of course, she's been gifted with the voice, being dragonborn. Kinoa is also plagued with visions of the past, reliving bloody battles and important moments in history. Kinoa's story really began when she ran away from her home in Sentinel, disobeying her militantly crowned parents in order to follow her calling as what ended up being less a shaman and more a paladin of kind. She learned more or less how to take care of herself on the road from Sentinel to Skyrim, but upon crossing the border she was apprehended and carted off to Helgen. There, she witnessed Alduin's return and promptly split off toward Falkreath, taking Rayloff at his word that they'd be better off going their separate ways. She had a rather harrowing encounter with the werewolf Sinding before heading to Whiterun to finally tell the Jarl about the dragons. In Chapter 2, she discovered her identity as the last dragonborn, and had a run-in with some of her countrymen in the form of Kimatu and Sadia. In Chapter 3, Kinoa made her way to Ustengrav and found the horn of Jurgen Windcaller missing, but rather than go after it for fear of being a trap, she took care of Movarth and headed to the Bard's College instead. In Chapter 4, after receiving the Greybeard's acknowledgement of her power, Kinwa went on a vision quest across Skyrim, where she began to have visions of Pelinal Whitestrike 
Ismir Wolfharth, and Tiber Septum. She also saved Zaytest from dying at the hands of werewolves, and Ingrath from dying at the hands of Dawnguard hunters. After nearly freezing to death in the Sea of Ghosts, she decided to stay in Dawnstar and help deal with Vermina's curse on the town, which is where Ingrath found her and recruited her at the beginning of the saga proper. From there she returned to Solitude to undertake the Paladin's Trials, and discovered Pelinal Whitestrake's old armor before falling into visions of a slaughter, and of Kyme. Kinua then returned to Delphine and did perhaps the worst infiltration of the Thalmor Embassy in history, teamed up with Zaytes to find Esbern, cleared out the Karth Spire, and managed to catch a bad case of bone break fever from a hag raven that sent her into visions on the way back to High Hrothgar. From there she spoke with Parthenax and teamed up with Arden to track down an Elder Scroll. While waiting for Arden's friend in episode 36, the entire Dawnbreaker's crew convened in the Winking Skeever, where Kinua managed to engineer a crude peace between them before leaving with Arden and Ingrath to go read some scrolls. She faced down Alduin on the throat of the world with the help of Parthenax, and convened a peace council between the Imperials and Stormcloaks before capturing Odaving and traveling to Skaldafen. We last left her reeling from her resounding defeat of Alduin, and the world-shattering revelations that came while she was in Sovngarde. Kinoa has the most obvious narrative role in the story as the team's dragonborn, but in terms of the team composition, she's also the defender and healer of the group. She is the heart of the team, but not necessarily its military or strategic leader. She is the shield that guards the others, and her natural empathy makes her the most inclined to befriend everyone and hold the team together. Now that Alduin is dead and she's become aware of just how powerful she could be, we'll get to see Kinua really blossom going forward. Looks like there's a couple of them. Why am I on fire again? Arden's story, Intonation, had the first aired prologue, which went up on August 28th, 2017, and the first official episode, which went up September 4th, 2017. At the time, I wasn't sure if I was going to do a full voice roleplay or a mix of in-character and out, but I pretty quickly settled into letting the characters speak for themselves. In World, he was the last to arrive in Skyrim besides Mordgood, though she had been in Skyrim before, prior to the story. More on that later. Ardenius Perseus Welk is the flaming gay sorcerer swordsman of the team, literally since he specializes in flame runes, an unapologetic nerd, a nervous talker, a brilliant strategist, and a surprisingly capable leader. While he seems like an unmitigated goofball on first inspection, Arden also has a more serious, ruthless, and paranoid side that comes out when Viscera starts to hit the fan. Arden grew up in Coral Cyrodiil, under the care of his mother, and spent his younger years as a locksmith's apprentice before enrolling with the College of Whispers. There, he met a slightly younger Ancano, who at the time was studying abroad as the Almeri equivalent of an honors student. The two of them ended up on a research team together, along with a Nord named Loftier, more on him later, and a Breton woman named Sigwin. Arden and Ancano developed a shy romantic relationship that lasted for several years before the Almeri Dominion recalled Ancano back to Alinor, leaving Arden to finish his enchanting and linguistics thesis on his own. In the intervening years, Arden became an expert on ancient languages and architecture, and because of his thesis project, with tattoos on his face, he is now able to read almost any written language, including Dovazul. Intonation begins seven years after Ancano was recalled, with Arden arriving in Bruma after having received an invitation from Savos Aaron, the Archmage at the College of Winterhold, to help out at the Sarthal excavation site. After dealing with some riffraff at the behest of Adius Vinius, Bruma's captain of the guard, Arden made his way to Falkyrie, where he was immediately accosted by Barbus, Clavicus Vile's talking dog. While trying to retrieve the Rufal Axe, Arden found the ruins of Volskig, where he defeated the dragon priest Volsung and learned the first word of Whirlwind Sprint, which he accidentally used in his elated and sleep-deprived state. After he returned the axe to Clavicus Vile and refused to take a boon, Arden found Meridia's beacon and returned it to her temple, where he defeated Melkoran and retrieved the sword Dawnbreaker, for which the saga is named. Oh, it's a sword! Oh, no. 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 Mer Meridia! Meridia, please! In Chapter 3, Arden finally made it to the College of Winterhold, where he found Onkano in full Thalmor regalia, acting as Savos Arryn's advisor. From there, he unearthed the Eye of Magnus and set out to retrieve a set of books stolen by a runaway student. 
In Chapter 4, Arden continued his investigation of both the Eye of Magnus and of Ancano, which led him into Mizolft and a confrontation with the then-mysterious Cayman upon his return to the surface. After returning to the college to find Ancano was quite mad and tampering with the Eye, he set out to Labyrinthian, where he defeated both Morokai and the Thalmor agent Astormo, who had Arden's dossier on his person. Having learned that Ancano had probably been an agent the whole time he was in Cyrodiil, Arden returned to the college once more with the intent to confront his former lover about it, only to end up killing him instead. A few days after, Cayman and Zaytest arrived at the college seeking a translator, and Arden confronted the Bosmer about what he knew and why he was seeking Arden out. The two of them teamed up to search for an ancient vampire artifact, which ended up being the Lady Serana, and upon returning her to her father Harkon, Arden, the only non-vampire of the group, was faced with a choice. In the midst of grieving a lost love, feeling desperate and trapped by the situation, and not seeing any other plausible way out, Arden chose to accept Harkin's gift. When he returned to consciousness, he was sent out to Redwater Den, where he met Dominique Gold, the vampire who originally turned Ingrath, who he teamed up with to retrieve a moth priest on his return to Castle Volgahar. Having heard part of the Tyranny of the Sun prophecy, Arden and Ingrath split up once again, with Arden heading to Winterhold to track down another scroll. After finding the madman Septimus Cygnus, he had a chat with Dominique about Ingrath's whereabouts, and was then approached by Kinoa, who was also looking for an Elder Scroll. The two of them teamed up to take on Alftand and Blackreach, and met the rest of the Dawnbreakers in episode 36 when they all convened the Winking Skeever. After finding that Dexian was blind, Arden, Ingrath, and Kinoa headed out to go read the three scrolls and decipher the rest of the prophecy, whereupon Arden activated his tattoos and learned some things about the universe that he really shouldn't have. From there, the team split up, with Kinoa taking the Dragon Scroll, and the other two heading into the Forgotten Vale to track down Oriel's bow. We last left Arden in charge of Clan Volgahar after soundly defeating Harkon. Straight to business, then? I'm a busy man, Lady Gold. This castle isn't gonna repair itself. Arden has had the most character development so far, from nervous goofball to tragic hero to confident leader. In terms of narrative, he is both the Lord of Clan Volgahar and the Archmage of the College of Winterhold, and will in time become the team's strategic leader as well. Since his arc is more or less complete, he'll be stepping aside somewhat to let the other characters shine, while still lending his not inconsiderable wit to the team. <laughs> Vagrant started in November of 2017, and was the second series to be introduced in both terms of original publication and on the complete playlist. Zaytest is a wily, sometimes silver-tongued, thunder-fairy ex-bandit Khajiit whose skill with a bow and daggers earned her the affectionate nickname of Stabcat on the character crusade Discord. She is an unshakable optimist and even more of a goofball than Arden, despite having been trained by one of the most serious and pessimistic characters in the series. She's a thief, an assassin, and a darn fine courier, and along with her big blue partner in crime, Inigo, she has managed to make a name for herself in Skyrim while remaining more or less out of the public eye. Her story started when she got shot on the job by a skooma-addled Inigo, after which her old mentor Ingrath found her and dropped her off as far away from danger as he could find a hunter's camp near Morthal. From there, Zaytest started from scratch, scavenging equipment and supplies from fallen soldiers on her way back to Riften to find the big blue cat who was supposed to be her partner. Upon arriving in the City of Thieves, Zaytest was contacted by Brynjolf, joined the Thieves Guild, and in the process of taking care of various shopkeepers, ran across a note about Inigo being in the Riften jail. After confronting him about what happened, the two took off to raid the Blackbriar estate and steal a horse. In Chapter 2, the two cats cleared out Mistwatch Keep, dealt with Golden Glow Estate, did some thieving in Markarth, and eventually found themselves in Windhelm investigating both the Butcher and Aventus Aretino. In Chapter 3, Zaytest was contacted by the Dark Brotherhood and subsequently kidnapped, before being contacted by Ingrath, getting her first Brotherhood contracts, and taking care of Honingbrew Meadery's skeever problem. In Chapter 4, Zaytest found out that Cicero, one of Ingrath's old friends, was alive just before setting out to take on Mawiri's contract. After slaying the bandits at Ralbathar, Inigo started having headaches, but managed to quell them long enough for them to head back to Falkreath and turn in the contract. On the way up to Solitude by way of Markarth, Zaytest and Inigo almost got mauled to death by a pack of werewolves, only to be saved by the dragonborn herself, Kinoa al-Murzim. 
One pit stop and an intimidation of Gullum Eye later, the two Khajiit headed to the Pale to see if they could find out the source of Inigo's migraines, and met Langley, the curmudgeonly mage who told them about his visions of a Doomstrider, and of Inigo's involvement in them. After a somewhat awkward conversation, the two cats headed back to Riften, where Mercer Frey recruited Zaytast for a mission into Winterhold to track down his old nemesis, Carlia. In the fray, Zaytest got poisoned by Carlia, backstabbed by Mercer, and ultimately dragged out of certain peril by Ingrath and Dominique, the former of whom then went out to recruit the only healer he trusted, Kinwa. A few days later, Zaytest awoke in pain and in shock, but once recovered, she and Ingrath took Gallus' journal to the Archmage to get it translated. After consulting with Carlia and Enthir, Zaytest took some time to deal with Dark Brotherhood business, and returned to confront the guild a few days later. While decompressing from the event, Kunua wandered into the Ragged Flagon in search of Esburn, and Zaytest helped her through the Ratway before gathering up Inigo and infiltrating Mercer's house. Zaytest then became a Nightingale on Carlia's orders, and the two of them and Brynjolf set out to hunt down Mercer Frey. See if you can- Okay. Carlia, when will you learn you can't get the oh. drop on me? Oh no. Uh, what? Okay. Oh, no. Once they dealt with him, Zaytest returned the skeleton key and returned to the Dark Brotherhood, where Astrid gave her a high-profile contract, the murder of the Emperor, which turned out to be a trap. Fearful for her friends in the Brotherhood, Zaytest hauled tail back to Falkreath and found Ingrath in the ashes of the Sanctuary. The two of them and Inigo returned to Solitude and met up with the rest of the Dawnbreakers there, before Zaytest and Inigo boarded the Kataraya and fulfilled the contract. We last left Zaytest on the back porch of Honeyside in Riften, having spent some time decompressing and doing favors for the Jarl. <laughs> we have a house now. <laughs> in a classic five-man band, Zaytest would be the smart one. She's not necessarily a tactical genius, but she excels at thinking on her feet, adapting to unfavorable circumstances, striking unseen from the shadows, and seeing things from a different perspective. As the team's nightingale, she'll be a valuable asset whenever stealth is involved, but, as the speediest Khajiit in Skyrim, she'll also act as the team's courier going forward. Now that things have calmed down somewhat, Zaytest will have an opportunity to really come into her own as Guildmaster, as well as a Nightingale and Dark Brotherhood assassin. Damn, did you do all that on your own? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Ingrath started out as a test character right around the time I was playing and recording the first chapter of Vagrant, but has since become so crucial to the story it's impossible to imagine it without him. What I thought was going to be a one-shot special titled Executioner aired on December 24th, 2017, but quickly became a series unto itself. Ingrath is now the first character we meet in the Complete Saga playlist. Ingrath Stormsong, aka Cayman, is our one-eyed Bosmer vampire ranger, and while he started out being a blood mage as well, due to some technical difficulties, I had to both scrap the idea and rebuild the character. He is the oldest of the Dawnbreakers, and has seen the most sheer horror in his life, having been pulled from the care of his mother, Hecura Rulani, by Almeri forces in Valenwood when he was barely old enough to be recruited. In his time, he has been a Thalmor scout, a deserter, a dark brother, the leader of a bandit clan, an axe for hire, one of Clan Volkahar's executioners, and in a lot of ways, an adoptive father figure for Zaytest. He's a cantankerous, Daedra-worshipping bastard with a heart of gold, a deep love for his family, and quite possibly the worst dad jokes in Tamriel. Anything you want to tell me about your family skeletons? Executioner began with Ingrath leaving Zaytest in the hunter's camp near Morthal, before traveling down to take care of a rogue vampire clan that moved into Movarth's lair at the behest of Lord Harkon. After that, he cleared out a silver hand refuge on his way to report to Harkon, and got ambushed by Thalmor on his way back out again. He traveled to Falkreath, took out Agent Sanyan, who was responsible for reporting his whereabouts, retrieved his dossier, and intercepted Sanyan's orders to lure an Imperial mage to Falkreath. He settled in up at Shriekwind Bastion to await for the mage. Then there's a long, unexplained gap between episodes. Presumably during this time he was laying low, hiding from the Thalmor, running favors for Harkon and Dominique while waiting, and possibly observing Kinua's movements since she arrived in Skyrim around this time. 
Whatever he was doing, I didn't initially plan for that long gap and it remains unexplained. Entry 4 opened on a nightmare of the destruction of the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary in Bruma, which he caused. From there, he made friends with some giants, completed some bounties, and eventually caught wind of the Imperial Mage he was waiting for. He managed to track Arden to Meridia's shrine, saved Yarnvita's life along the way, and left a warning about the Thalmor waiting for Arden in Winterhold. A few days later, Ingrath held a ritual to contact Hersene and asked his patron for guidance, only to find Mephala whispering at him instead. With nothing solid to go on, Ingrath rode for Riften, intending to speak with Zaytest, but got intercepted, captured by a Thalmor patrol, and held at Mistwatch until Dominique Gold broke him out. After a brief stop in Riften to check in with Zaytest, he cleared out Molag Ball's haunted house, found himself among Nymira cultists, nearly died to a Hagraven at Hag's End, and finally returned to Riften for his next assignments from Dominique. The first saw him killing off the Blood Horkers and their leader Halden, the second was disposing of Endari at the Radiant Raiment in Solitude. Once those tasks were taken care of, Ingrath returned to what remains of the Bruma Sanctuary for the first time in years, where Mafala named him her listener. Afterward, he took on the contract to kill the Emperor, revealed himself to Cicero, and nearly got killed by Dawnguard hunters near Falder's Tooth, which Kinua had just finished clearing out. She patched him up and they went on their separate ways, Ingrath to go ask Dominique for help interpreting Amon Motier's instructions. In exchange, she asked him to kill Sibby and Ingen Blackbriar, and while he had no problem with Sibby, instead of killing Ingen, he helped her run away from home and disappear instead. Outside, Dominique found him again, and the two of them chased down Zaytest to rescue her from Mercer Frey, and found her poisoned within an inch of her life by Carlia. Now get out of here before I rip your throat out with my fangs. Ingrath tracked down Kinua to help save her, and then teamed up with Arden to finally retrieve Harkin's daughter. Once making sure Arden wasn't going to die, he killed Victoria Vici, and struck off toward Winterholt to meet back up with him. On the way, he found Cicero and the Dawnstar Sanctuary, as well as Arden and Serana. The trio tracked down a moth priest, and then split off again. Ingrath and Serana made their way through the Soul Cairn, and when they came out the other side, Ingrath was beset by visions of the Falkreath Sanctuary burning down. He left in an attempt to save Zaytest, and nearly died in the fire himself. He passed along the Emperor contract to her and met back up with Arden and the other Dawnbreakers in the Winking Skeever, before finishing out the rest of the Dawnguard questline alongside Arden. We last left him, having made his feelings about the mage very clear. Arden, you're... something else. From the get-go, Ingrath has been one of the major connecting threads drawing everyone's stories together. He's the tactician of the group, knows how to get information out of people, and can fill in for some of the practical knowledge that the book-smart Arden lacks. Since his story so far has been so involved, he'll be taking more of a back seat in the coming seasons, while trying to navigate his new situation and starting to rebuild the Dark Brotherhood. Ayala, hey little help here. Never mind. Yarnvita's series Unblooded started in February 2018. By this time I knew what her main goals would be, and that Mordgood existed, but I didn't bring her in until a year later. Yarnvita the Skull, or recently Yarnvita the Harbinger, has always been the character I struggled with the most in terms of telling a compelling story. She is stubborn as a boulder and just about as forthcoming, but I've managed to pick away at her tough outer shell a little bit over the years. She's a heavy-armored, halberd-wielding badass grandma with a soft spot for children who originally set out to take revenge on the Forsworn for killing one of her sons. She's also a werewolf, but seems to be coping with it better than the youngsters and the companions. Unblooded opened with Yarnvita arriving by ship in Windhelm, where she decided to test her strength by taking care of some business for both Brunwolf Freewinter and the old man at the White File. When she tried to join the Stormcloaks, Galmar turned her down and she left for Whiterun instead. There she found Fralia Greymane, and decided to help her find out what happened to her missing son, a search that led her to Northwatch Keep, where she swiftly executed the Thalmor inside and freed Thoral Greymane, before heading to Markarth, confident in her abilities. In Chapter 2, Yarnvita hacked her way through several Forsworn camps on her way to the city, where she discovered and investigated a conspiracy around the Forsworn in Sidna Mine. Upon confronting Nepos the Nose, however, Yarnvita unleashed a blood rage and slaughtered one of his men while he cowered in a corner, which shook her up so bad that she had to leave, 
a path which led her halfway into a Forsworn camp before they cut her down. Thankfully, Cayman was passing through the Reach, and managed to save her before she bled out for good. On returning to Margarth, Yarnvita was arrested and thrown into Sidna Mine, where she finally got her revenge, killing the King in Rags and his crew. Not knowing what to do with herself afterward, Yarnvita made her way back to Whiterun and joined the Companions on a whim. When Farkas revealed himself to be a werewolf, Yarnvita was inducted into the Circle and became a werewolf herself, following in the footsteps of her father, Ulf Ragni Redsighted. From there, she and Ayala took the fight to the Silver Hand, and on a mission into the Rift, where Yarnvita got hopelessly lost and found herself in Riften, she heard rumors of a bunch of troublemakers causing havoc nearby. When she went to investigate this, she found a gateway to Falskar, the land where her ex-husband Lopdeer, yes, that Lopdeer, hailed from. With no way to get back home, she decided to help the people of Falskar, uncovering the beginnings of a war with Ingvar Unvalder at the head of the opposition. Together, she and the warriors of Amber Creek took the fight to Ingvar, eventually chasing him into a cave containing the so-called Heart of the Gods, where he challenged Yarnvita to single combat. Upon Ingvar's defeat, she returned to Amber Creek a hero, and eventually made her way back to Skyrim to complete the task that Aella had given her to begin with. From there, she was sent by Kodlak to take out the Glenmoral Witch Coven in an effort to cure his lycanthropy, but the Silver Hand attacked while she was away. On her return, however, she finally met Cayman face to face, and he offered to help her and Vilkis take revenge. Afterward, Yarnveda and the rest of the Circle traveled to Iskramor's tomb in order to posthumously break Kodlak's lycanthropy, and when the process succeeded, Yarnveda was named the new Harbinger. While resting at the Night Gate Inn and mulling over what happened, Yarnveda and her granddaughter Morgud were reunited and decided to travel together up to Solitude to take care of some pirates. They found the rest of the Dawnbreakers at the Winking Skeever, and while she wasn't exactly comfortable with the vampires in the room, Yarnvita did apologize to Kinoa for yelling at her at the Windhelm docks when they met previously. Once the pirates were taken care of, Yarnvita returned alone to Whiterun to continue helping the companions, until she was approached by Kinoa in order to help put together a peace council. We last left the Harbinger in Whiterun, waiting with the rest of the companions in case the Dragonborn failed her mission to defeat Alduin. Yeah. Because if you don't come back, that means Alduin won. And that means the end of times really is upon us. Yarnvita is the tank of the group, willing to wade headfirst into trouble even if it means coming out the other side caked in blood. So far, her role in the overarching narrative has been limited, but as I'm sure her series title of Unblooded would suggest, her role as a battlefield commander and even as a mother and grandmother will come right to the forefront as the Civil War comes to a head. Vivek's hairless door, what is this? What are you gawking at? Ah, the mess! Mordgood appeared briefly in the trailer for Unblooded, but I didn't know if I was going to do anything with her until Couch Warrior suggested we do a crossover. Thus, Book of Shadows was born, and Mordgood first officially joined the saga in February of 2019. Mordgood Hela's daughter, also named Mordgood Blackshoulder, is the youngest member of the cast, though not in terms of chronological age, that title belongs to Zay Test. She's also the newest fleshed out character, even beating out Hagatha, who hasn't even appeared in person yet. Mordgood is a brash, sharp-tongued, headstrong, sometimes naive young Dunmer motivated by a desire to make a difference in the world, but plagued by an ill-controlled talent for channeling which often leaves her open to possession. She's a light-armored combatant with an innate talent for fire magic and a Nord's arm for two-handed weapons, favoring a greatsword and warhammers. She's also a Vancean mage, with her capacity for casting coming not from her own magical pool, but from the aid of her tag-along ancestor spirit, Zainab Krodansha. Having been adopted by Yarnvita's daughter Hela, Mordka combines a Skull's love of family and faith in the Allmaker with an Ashlander's perseverance and creative spirit. A spirit which has been put to good use by her friend and confidant Theral after an incident at the House of Troubles in Falkreath involving the Thalmor. She communicates with Theral via a Book of Shadows, a journal that lets them send messages over long distances, thus the name of the series. Do you mind not doing that right next to my ear while I'm trying to have a conversation with the council? That's fine. Book of Shadows began with Mordgood arriving in Ravenrock, having left her nomadic home with Hela and Balder and Morrowind in search of their grandmother Yarnvita, who at that point was still in Falskar. 
She immediately headed to the mysterious shrine being built around the earth stone outside of town, and upon trying to get some rest for the night had her first interaction with Mirak, the traitor of Skull Legend. Her exploration of the area led her to a mess made by Teltrin Sero, a Dunmer spellsword and mercenary, which began an investigation into the Sea Tiger, a dead Nord, unjust bounties, and at least one very powerful vampire that came very close to killing her. Her search for answers led her all over and under Soulslime and into Skyrim, culminating in a battle against Sigrun's pirates. In the midst of Master Neloth's bombardment of the ship, Mordgood managed to get Teldrum free, but passed out in the water and had a vision of her ancestor in which he finally told her his name. After confronting Neloth and learning that Sigrun herself was in Skyrim, Mordgood left Soulslime and reunited with her grandmother at the Nightgate Inn. The two of them traveled together to Solitude, where they met the rest of the Dawnbreakers before heading to Broganor Grotto to take out the pirates. Yarnvida and Morgood had a heart-to-heart -heart before Morgood left for Solstheim again to turn in Sigrun's bounty. On the way, she discovered that her Book of Shadows had somehow become corrupted, rendering all of Theral's entries unreadable. In trying to understand what happened, she found someone new on the other end of the book, an altmer mage named Hegatha seeking to join the Dawn Guard. We last left Morgood having just come out of Blood Skull Barrow with a new blade, and a mysterious tome that teleported her to Apocrypha on reading it. Did you just say she had Gorus beard, you're an ugly one? I knew I wasn't the only one who cursed in Daedra. Having had the shortest story so far, Mordgood's role isn't well defined yet. If the rest of the team is a five-man band, Mordgood is the sixth ranger. In the coming seasons, I expect her weirder side will come out a bit more, especially with more time spent around Kinoa and possibly Hagatha. For those of you wondering how I could possibly have another character doing the Dawnguard quest despite Arden and Ingrath having already completed it, don't worry, I have plans. I don't care who you think you're driving here, but... We're not going that way. We're not going after some... What, Dragonborn? What's that even mean? So what does the future hold for the Dawnbreakers? Aside from the Dawnguard side of the Dawnguard DLC, we have two major questlines left to contend with. One of those is the Civil War, which will finally push Yarnvita, and probably Mordgood, to the front of the ensemble. And the other is Dragonborn, with Mirak as the ultimate antagonist. My original plans for the saga really only went up to the defeat of Harkon and Alduin. Since I really, honestly didn't think I'd get this far, I'm still working on my plans going forward, especially into the war. I've only recently, as of the last few days, decided which side to pick, if that tells anyone anything. I do know that there will be a winter arc where we focus more on roleplay and inter-character relations rather than on big narrative quests, and I know that at some point, Arden will probably get around to fixing up Winterhold. Beyond that, I guess we'll find out. This one does not like how it squishes her ears, but no. Thanks for watching the story so far. I'd like to thank my patrons, past and present, who have made the last three years possible, including The Wind, William, aka Haggis Hunter, Jay, Jaren, Jacob, Traliant, Simon, Gemma, David, the illustrious Couch Warrior, my wonderful mother, and my newest patron and mod support guy, the mighty Bayofish. Since my channel isn't monetized at all, your contributions and support have been extremely appreciated, and I only hope I can continue to be entertaining. If you're watching this and you'd like to support me or the series, consider subscribing on YouTube, becoming a patron, or buying me a coffee. I look forward to continuing the Dawnbreakers saga. Stay safe out there, fight well, and quick save often. Riding, 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 my steed is a law abiding. Write them down, pick them up, arrest the scum, have some fun, take a bribe, ruin the vibe. Law hide! <laughs>